In this part of the lecture, we will be looking closely at the uh, at the first type of the transporter or rather membrane proteins or transport membrane proteins, which is the transporter and how actually they facilitate the active membrane transport. Uh, just remember, active membrane transport is the movement of materials across the concentration gradient and we have to input uh, energy for that to happen. So here is an illustration of your uh, transporters. These are the carriers or the permeases and how they transport materials against uh, towards or against the concentration region. So as I mentioned earlier, the transporters are actually very similar to enzymes. So we can actually model how they transport uh, molecules uh, using the concept of enzyme kinetics. So here is uh, kinetics of a simple diffusion with versus your membrane, uh, rather transport mediated diffusion. So here is the rate of transport on the y axis and on the x axis the concentration of your molecule. So we have here at simple uh, simple diffusion. So you have this amount of um, Molecule. So, this, the X is the concentration of the transported molecule. So, as you can see here, the transporter mediated diffusion uh, actually uh, was, or is actually able to transport a large amount of molecules even at lower concentration compared to simple diffusion. Although they have a break even point here where um, at a certain concentration both the active trans uh, active uh, transport or rather the transporter mediated uh, diffusion and the uh, passive uh, diffusion or rather there is no transporter involved is uh, seem to be equal so this is the break even point and then for the transporter it actually slows down because again uh, even it plateaus at larger concentration because only of course they are like enzymes there's only a certain amount that ca they can accommodate at a certain given time so that's their maximum amount so the transporters as i said they share similar characteristics to your enzymes so the rate of the transporter mediated diffusion reaches the maximum when you have here the saturation and the, the plateau here is what you call the saturation point so the, at this level you have um more cons more molecules to be transported than there are transporters and that's their vmax they are completely saturated so the solute concentration when the transport rate is at half maximum is its km so it's similar to the michaelis constant of your transporter so uh, the michaelis constant is also uh, a measure or it gives us an idea how of the binding how um how a solute uh, binds easily to your transporter so that's the Michaelis constant. So in this graph, it applies a transporter moving a single solute. So the kinetics of coupled transport of two or more solutes is more complex and exhibits a more cooperative behavior. So as you can see here, you have this um, uh, curve which uh, shows us a more cooperative side to the transporter mediation. So it actually is like exponential. It's similar to an exponential graph. Uh, sorry, not an exponential. It's a logarithmic. So you have a higher, in, uh, at smaller concentration, it increases easily. So you have a cooperative behavior here. So there are three main ways transporters carry out active transport. So first is having coupled transporters. So coupled transporters harness the energy stored in concentration gradients to couple the uphill transport of one solute across the membrane to the downhill transport of another. So this is for active transport. So when we have coupled transporters, they are usually either symports or antiport. So we have here a concentration gradient of solute 1 and we want to actively transport solute 2. So take note, these are different solutes. So solute 1 has a concentration gradient. Uh, for example, um, the gradient is greater outside, smaller inside. So the tendency is for the solute 1 to pass through the cell. So for a coupled transporter, it, it follows the concentration gradient of solute 1. At the same time, it transports solute 2 at the same time, but this time it's against the concentration gradient. And um, Moving on to the example, solute 2 is also greater uh, inside than it is outside. And for example, for solute, uh, for coupled transporters, it will transport solute 1 
but it would also transport solute to um, on a different direction. So uh, later on, you will see here in a diagram. But in coupled transporters, uh, it transports to different solutes. One follows the concentration gradient, which is a passive transport, and the other is the active transport. So meaning to say, coupled transporter harnesses the diffusion, the passive transport of one solute to transfer another solute against the concentration gradient. And then the, the second type is the ATP-driven pumps. So ATP-driven pumps, as, you, as its name suggests, ATP, it has, uh, it involves the hydrolysis of ATP. So it, it's actually a direct, um, direct application of energy. So direct use. So you have uh, the uphill transport. It couples the uphill transport and the hydrolysis of ATP. And as you remember, ATP is the energy currency of the cell. So a hydrolysis of ATP releases amount of, uh, a large amount of energy. And that energy is being used by these pumps to drive the, uh, rather to transport the solutes uh, uh, against the concentration gradient. And then we have the light or the redox-driven pumps. We usually find them in bacteria, archaea, as well as in our own mitochondria and in the plant's chloroplast. So they couple uphill transport to an input of energy from light in the case of chloroplast and as well as uh, bacterial rhodopsins or from a redox reactions such as those used by the mitochondria using cytochrome c oxidase so when one for example in here for uh, in a chloroplast when light enters or rather when a photon uh, strikes your um, photosynthetic center it will trigger a series of reaction which would uh, culminate in the movement of solutes across the, uh, against the concentration gradient. So light energy or even the energy from redox, uh, reduction oxidation reactions are being used to drive the movement of the solutes across its own concentration gradient. So that's the light or redox driven pumps. So here is one example of, uh, rather these are the um, Diagram of the three ways for driving the active transport. So as I said, for a coupled transporter, it involves two different solutes. So one solute is driven towards its concentration gradient and the other one is against. So the, the it's actually transporting two solutes simultaneously or in series depending on the, uh, the actual action of the mechanism of this transporter. But... Uh, the movement is it harnesses the concentration gradient of one solute to work against a concentration gradient of another solute. And then for the ATP-driven pump, here you have one, one domain which hydrolyze, hydrolyzes the ATP, and the energy is being used to drive the movement against a concentration gradient. For the light-driven or redox-driven pump, so you have light energy that allows the transport against the concentration gradient. So for the coupled transporters, so we have here uh, two types of um, transporters being used by coupled transport. So the usual transporter, by default, we are thinking of a uniport, which also which is only specific to a certain solute. So it only transport one type of solute at a time. But for coupled transport, since they transport two solutes simultaneously, so they are uh, they can or rather they can bind to those two solutes at the same time but remember uh, even though they bind two different solutes they still retain the specificity for each solute so that means that uh, for example this one solute one has a different binding site than solute two and that is how they are able to drive this um, active transport using the concentration gradient of another solute so for a for the coupled transport, we have two types, the sim port and the antiport. So when we have the sim port, the movement is still, or rather the movement is on the same direction. So for example, going inside. So the co-transported ion, this is usually the, the passive diffusion. This, uh, the concentration gradient of this co-transported ion is the one driving the transportation, the active transport of this molecule. So they, they move across the membrane at the same time. An example of that is the uh, glucose, uh, sodium glucose uh, pump or carrier, sodium glucose carriers or even glucose carriers. 
they uh, what drives the glucose carriers against the concentration gradient or, as, or rather aside from the concentration gradient is the concentration of the sodium ions so the sodium ions drives the cell to, to intake the or rather it drives the active transport of glucose to the inside of the cell so for the second type we have the antiport for the antiport the movement is um actually is against one another so one solid enters the other goes out so that's the the, the tendency or the type of movement that is being um uh, that is actually happening so they are on the opposite directions so here is an example of a sim port so a glucose transport that is fueled by the sodium gradient so usually find them in the muscles uh in the muscle cells muscle tissues so here, remember uh, from the previous part of this lecture, we have a large amount of sodium ions outside. And because of the concentration gradient of the sodium, we have an electrochemical gradient because the interior of the cell is negative. So you have a membrane potential, a negative membrane potential to the interior. So you have a electrochemical gradient that pushes sodium to enter the cell. And this gradient, this electrochemical gradient is actually what drives this uh, sodium uh, glucose transport to, uh, to transport your glucose concentration. So here in, in the interior of the cell, is there's much more glucose concentration inside so the tendency is small concentration of glucose outside large concentration of glucose outside so you are actually transporting glucose against the concentration gradient but you have an electrochemical gradient as well of the sodium ion from the outside so they want to come in so this is a sim port so for every movement because the sodium ions wanted to come in so it will all it will bind to the transporter and at the same time, before the transporter changes its conformation, it must mine the two solute. The first is the sodium, the other one is the glucose. And then it will change conformation and drive it inside. So once it's unbound, it will go back to the uh, original conformation. So the because the sodium ions wants to come in, they will of course bind with this transporter. But for the glucose, uh, they do not wish to bind to the, uh, or rather, uh, the all this, the concentration is smaller, but for this for the sodium ion to enter, it must require glucose. So you, you are, the the I, the sodium is basically the one that's driving the movement of this transporter to go to the interior of your cell. So basically, this is your sodium glucose transport. So this is the coupled. Uh, co-transported molecule which is the one that's driving this transporter okay so aside from uh, this uh, simport mechanism the distribution of the transporters in cells is actually one of the ways in how uh, the cells can control what passes through these lipid bilayers so example here is your the epithelial cells this is in our uh, gut uh, in our intestines in our guts so you have here the glucose is pumped into the cell by the sodium powered glucose importer so this is a coupled transport so the glucose from the food that we eat so this is being imported inside the cell using the uh, powered by the sodium uh, electrochemical gradient so the intestinal lumen so you have here a concentration gradient lower and a higher inside the cell now because it's the intestinal lumen the it uh, the this epithelial cells, the main function of this epithelial cell is to absorb the glucose, the food from our uh, digestive tract, and pass it to the interior of our body. Actually, it passes it through the bloodstream. So how does it do that? So you have, of course, uh, facing the gut lumen, you have the glucose uh, potassium symporter. And then once the glucose enters, so it's just moving passively uh, through a glucose uniporter in the basal and the lateral membrane domain so there's also a different transporter here but the transporter here is actually uh, a uniporter so it's just a passive uniporter because the interior of the cell has a high glucose concentration it will of course follow the concentration gradient and go to this lower uh, glucose concentration which is the extracellular fluid so the movement is from the gut lumen going to the interior of the cell and then passing through the cell and then to the outside of the cell to the extracellular fluid.
Now, the sodium gradient driving the glucose import is maintained by your sodium potassium pump in the basal and lateral membrane. So, you have a sodium potassium pump here. They're also pumping the sodium ions outside and um, importing your potassium inside. So, here it maintains, this pump maintains a low sodium concentration. And that is so that the concentration gradient of sodium is low inside the cell, high outside the cell. So, this is what drives this, um, uh, this concentration gradient for the sodium. And the sodium concentration gradient drives the absorption of glucose by the intestinal lumen. So, the adjacent cells are connected by impermeable tight junctions. So, from between here, what separates the gut lumen from the extracellular fluid is your tight, junct tight junctions. So, the function of this one is to prevent the solutes from clo clo closing the epithelium uh, between the cells. So, because we are transporting glucose from the gut lumen to the, in the, to the interior of our body, which is the extracellular fluid, um, from the outside of the cell, we don't want the extracellular fluid to mix with the gut lumen. And hence, we have tight junctions here. So, it prevents movement of the glucose from crossing between in between the cells. And they also serve as diffusion barriers within the plasma membrane so that the glucose uniporter here in the basal and lateral area won't cross over to this uh, area that faces the gut lumen. So it because remember the the cell membrane is very fluid. So our the the membrane uh, proteins are actually moving along. Uh, they are like uh, boats in the sea. So they are actually moving along the uh, in the sea of your bilayer or lipid bilayer. So in order to prevent this symporter to go over here and this uniporter to go to the outside, so you have these tight junctions that keeps this transporter in this side and that transporter on that side. So basically, this is one mechanism of the cell to actually uh, control their transport of uh, different solutes through these cells. So those are for uh, uh, the coupled transporters. Now let's look at the ATP-driven pumps. So the ATP-driven pumps, we often call them ATPase because they hydrolyze ATP to ADP and phosphate and they use the energy released uh, to pump ions or other solutes across the membrane. So we have P-type pumps. They are structurally and functionally related multi-pass transmembrane proteins. And uh, the reason why they are called P-type because they phosphorylate themselves during their pumping cycle. So remember, I ATP hydrolysis is what drives them. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So hydrolysis, when we say hydrolysis of ATP, we are cleaving the phosphate from, because uh, ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, we have three phosphate groups. So we are cleaving one phosphate group from ATP to produce ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So what happens to the, to the, uh, to the removed phosphate, the third phosphate group? It is uh, for the P-type transporters, they, they put the phosphates to themselves. So the phosphate group is transferred from the ATP molecule to the, uh, the P-type pumps. So these um, ion pumps are responsible for setting up and maintaining gradients for sodium, potassium, the hydronium or the proton gradient, and even the calcium, uh, calcium ion gradients across the cell membrane. And then we have your ABC transporters. We call them ABC because uh, ABC stands for ATP binding cassette transporter. They are structurally different from the P-type ATP aces. And their usual activity is to pump small molecules across cell membranes. So for the ABC transporters, these are actually the headache for drug designers. Because for cancer cells, uh, especially for those designing uh, anti-cancer drugs, because cancer cells have a very active ABC transporters. And because ABC transporters pump small molecules, they pump the anti-cancer drug out of the cancer cell. And that is how cancer cells are able to uh, subsist, uh, even in the presence of very strong drugs. So eventually, they develop ABC transporters that pumps out the anti-cancer drug and allows them to survive. And then we have the V-type pumps. So the V-type pumps, they are turbine-like protein machines constructed from multiple subunits. <laughs> 
So we have here your the, th the three types of uh, ATP-driven pumps. So th actually, the, one of the most common or the simplest one is the P-type. So the hydrolysis of ATP, the phosphate group is transferred to this um, to the P-type pump. For the ABC transporter, usually to ATP, so they just release the phosphate group. And then for the V-type proton pump, so again, they release the phosphate and they are usually found in the proton transport. Now, we have a special type of V-type pump or sometimes they call it the, um, they call it the uh, sister of, or rather a subset of your V-type pump, which is the F-type. But this F-type pump is actually a passive transporter. So in here, for the V-type proton pump, it uses ATP to drive hydrogen or rather the proton against the concentration gradient so this is an active transport but for the f type pump we call it uh, atp synthase it this one is it does the opposite so it allows the passive diffusion of proton gradient of the proton the hydronium ion it allows the passage of the hydronium ion through it and while hydronium ion or rather it harnesses this passive diffusion of hydronium ion to actually generate atp so here, for the V-type pump, it spends ATP. For the F-type pump, it generates the ATP using the hydronium ion gradient. So the F-type is a synthesizer of ATP and it's a passive transporter because it allows the movement of the protons along the concentration gradient. You will see this one in uh, mitochondria and chloroplast. So, looking at the pumping cycle of the sarcoplastic reticulum calcium ion pump. So, here is your P-type pump. So, you have your, it's actually uh, an antiporter, you can say that, because it, uh, it transports hydronium ion and calcium ions in two different directions. But, again, it's driven by ATP. So, ATP will bind to this one and it will become hydrolyzed. So, first you have... Uh, the calcium ion first, of course, two calcium ions will first bind here, and then it will close. Once it is closed, the ATP will be hydrolyzed, and then it will, uh, once the hydrolysis of ATP happens, it will release the ATP and get another ATP. So this uh, confirmation, ATP bound plus phosphate bound, it will open uh, one side of the channel to, to release the bound calcium, and then to go back, it will require the binding of another hydrogen. And then, once bound, it will close. And again, it will release your phosphate group and go to the orig original conformation where the hydrogen ions will be released on the other side. So, and then it will wait for another calcium ion to pass through. So again, the you will see here conformational changes in the protein. So each conformational change in this protein is triggered by what actually binds here. For example, here, the conformational, the first conformational change is triggered by the binding of the calcium ions. The second one is uh, the hydrolysis of your ATP, ADP2, ADP2, ADP plus the phosphate. And uh, once it happens, it will then uh, trigger the the uh the binding of another ATP. So once another ATP binds, it will then undergo another conformational change. And then once um the uh this uh the calcium is released and another proton enters, it will then undergo another conformational change. So basically, binding of the different uh, binding and release of the different uh, substrates at different sites. This is actually an allosteric enzyme, you can say that, because it binds multiple substrates onto different sites. So you have uh, this binding mechanism that triggers conformational change, and that's how it, it triggers the transport of the molecules across the cell membrane. So we have the plasma membrane, sodium-potassium pump, that establish your sodium and potassium gradients. So this is another ATP-driven pump, and is also an antiporter. So this ATP driven pump, which is uh, it, it drives two different solutes against the concentration gradient. So it's an, it's not like although it's an antiporter, it's not a coupled transporter, because both solutes are moving against the concentration gradient, and it is being powered by ATP. So this uh, sodium potassium pumps, it uh, it rather it moves your potassium to the inside of the cell 
and it transports sodium to the outside. And then for the AD ABC transporters, so here is another ABC transporter. So just like the previous transporter, the binding of different solutes, different substrates, so the, the transporter is actually um, one of the main triggers of the conformational changes of these um, transporters. So you have two types. This is the bacterial ABC transporter and the eukaryotic ABC transporter. So although they are very structurally similar, the difference is that the movement of the molecule. So for the bacterial transporter, it allows the movement of solute molecules to the interior, but the eukaryotic ABC transporters move small solute molecules to the exterior. And uh, again, as I said, this is usually found as a defense mechanism in cancer cells because it moves the small solute molecules outside of the cancer cell. Basically, this small solute molecule is your anti-cancer drug more often than not. Okay, so that's it for the transporter. So in the next part of the lecture, we will talk about the channels and the electrical properties of membranes.